Welcome. You are listening to Guiding Stars, Evolutionary Astrology Radio. This is your host, Kristen Fontana, and I'm here with David Green today. We are discussing planetary phases, in particular looking at Moon-Saturn, the Moon-Saturn phase, which is a relationship between where your natal moon sits and your Saturn. And before we get into it, I just wanted to welcome Deva back to Guiding Stars. Welcome back, Deva. Thanks for having me back. Bet. All right. Is there anything you'd like to announce before we get started? A uh, call for translators. It's a super exciting time for the school as we've had a number of uh, Jeffrey Wolf Green books uh, translated into other languages. So if you're interested, it's a wonderful way to promote the school and also to learn evolutionary astrology in the process. So please give me an email if you're interested and we'll go from there. All right. Excellent. And also, I might as well announce this today. Dave, I can hear your breathing. <laughs> Sorry. Um, it's okay. Um, which is good. We want to have good breath these days. because All that's going on in the world. Um, but we um, are so excited on the message board because Ari Moshe is starting a new series or a new thread on the message board for beginners. The beginner's beginner even. If you know nothing about astrology uh, and you are literally starting from the beginning, you get to practice from the beginning with uh, some great teachers there. And a lot of people are joining this thread already. A lot of people are home and wanting to go deeper in their life and their journey. And this is a perfect way to, to deepen into your astrology. Also, if you know evolutionary astrology um, <clears throat> and you want to practice the basics, you are also welcome to be a part of this so uh, it's going to be a great a great way to connect with everybody at this time we're all feeling a little uh you know disconnected i think in ways and this is a way to to feel more connected so we welcome you and evolutionary astrology really goes unmatched with its respect to its de depth and ability to cut to the core of the soul and its journey um, obviously, the Pluto paradigm goes far in explaining the journey of the soul, but, but there are also other operating parts working in concert with Pluto to complete the evolutionary picture. Um, really, the Pluto paradigm shows it all, I should say, <laughs> but there are, there are also many operating parts working in concert with Pluto and the paradigm, and also to fill in the details, more of the story. Uh, perhaps even the timing. <clears throat> and this can be seen in the planetary phases and aspects. So welcome to the soul's evolutionary roadmap. All right, next slide. Now, this is the wheel that we look at. It looks very similar to the wheel that we look at when we're looking at a chart, but there are eight phases or eight sections similar to the houses in the zodiac, we, or we have 12 houses. This time it's separated into eight. <clears throat> and this zero to 360 wheel reflects the principles of evolution, just like the wheel of the zodiac. It's no difference here uh, than Aries to Pisces, except for we have new phase to balsamic phase, new phase Aries, balsamic phase Pisces. And we're, we're gonna get uh, into a very specific phase today, looking at the Moon-Saturn phase and, and Crescent phase, but we want to give you a, a little foundational information first if you're just joining us. It's really important to look at this wheel in terms of evolution so you don't get confused, uh, and also so you go in order of the zodiac. The new phase is really Aries, like 30 degrees of Aries plus about 15 degrees of Taurus, and so on. Now the cycle and phases of the cycle of these phases and aspects tells you what stage of evolution your soul is in relative to the two planets that you're going to be looking at, as well as how those two planets operate archetypically. Uh, we decided to do a series on Saturn and the moon um, because, well, for one, I don't think we've ever done it on the stars, but also Dave, well, why don't you share with the listeners why why Saturn moon? 
Yeah, uh, we picked Saturn Moon because, as you were saying, uh, there we haven't done a series about that yet, and also that it really connects to one's inner and outer world, how one's inner world is reflected in the external world, and it's an important connection to make relative to fourth house, tenth house moon Saturn archetype. So by looking at uh, the particular phase and also of course natal position of the the moon and also Saturn, you can look uh, and you can look at the specific inner emotional reality that the soul is creating for itself and why and how that inner reality is then being outpictured in the external environment, whether that's through the parents, uh, whether that's through the social career. Um, so looking at those two in uh, together, uh, you can get a, a deeper understanding as to why that soul or uh, how that soul's inner reality is being reflected in the external world. Right. I mean, this is huge. I mean, Saturn being the outer world, the Capricorn ruler, and that moon being our inner world, our inner home. And this couldn't be more uh, really current to the times that we're all living in because so many people who are used to being out in the world in a certain way are being forced into the moon into their moon <laughs> in essence it's interesting too in that saturn and capricorn has just moved into the sign of aquarius which you know ruled by uranus always walk, knocking on saturn's door right to liberate us in some way to wake us up in some way so the timing is is ideal to really be looking at your own personal chart and the phasal relationship between your saturn and your moon now let, let's, we can do this with any two planets, just so you know, you can use this wheel with any two planets that you have in your chart, but we're looking at Saturn and the moon, and this is how we do it. We take the slower moving planet to determine the planetary phase between any two planets, and we make that station. So in this case, we'll put Saturn at, at zero Aries, or whatever sign it, it is. Actually, you can put Saturn anywhere and just move it to the zero degree mark and start counting counterclockwise the degree away from your moon. And that will be the degree of separation. <clears throat> so in this case, uh, a, a crescent phase sextile between Saturn and the moon is being shown. Again, you, you count counterclockwise on the wheel and this will determine the phase. The phase we know is crescent, the aspect is sextile. So we first have to determine the phase before we drop in the aspect, the direct aspect there where the moon sits. All right, uh, any, any other things that I've, anything else that I need to share before we start talking about this more specifically, Ava? Um, when you're looking at phases and aspects in terms of understanding uh, an aspect, uh, you have to take that in context or first determine the phase that any given aspect is in. There are two conjunctions, there are two oppositions, two squares, and so on. Um, for example, uh, a gibbous opposition is going to be experienced very, very differently than a full phase opposition, even though they're both oppositions. Um, the gibbous opposition uh, can be experienced in a very Virgo-like way. Um, the soul kind of taking in criticism or saying, okay, <laughs> um, uh, uh, being uh, in terms of experiencing uh, like a sense of opposition or polarity with the external environment, uh, the evolutionary intentions of oppositions are to throw something off. Where in full phase, that soul is going to be tr uh, trying to exert almost its own will or coming back full phase, full force um, at those who are perceived at creating opposition most of the time. Uh, and so it can be experienced in a Libra type way, uh, extremity. <laughs> Um, so it's just an example, uh, same with uh, conjunctions, the balsamic and the new phase are very different. Uh, new phase conjunction, very Aries, uh, start of a, a new evolutionary cycle, whereas the balsamic conjunction is a uh, 12th house, it's bringing something to closure. Um, so the reason uh, to bring to talk about that is to emphasize the importance of starting with the face or looking at the face to understand how that aspect uh, is to be given meaning in a personal context. 
great. Okay, so let's let's make it really specific now. Um, let's leave the, David the breathing on the microphone. <laughs> Sorry. Gotcha. Thanks. Um, anyway, so uh, let's use the sextile on the other side of Saturn. It's called a last quarter sextile. They're both sextiles, but that last quarter phase is going to operate very differently than this crescent phase that we're talking about today. So if you know you have a Saturn moon sextile, uh, let's, um, you know, figure out for yourself if it's going to be a crescent phase that we're talking about today or a last quarter. And you start with Saturn and you count counterclockwise. So that's, that's a, a big difference, um, those two energies. Obviously, that last quarter phase is going to feel uh, very Aquarian in nature, um, breaking free from, a, from a, a traditional way of doing things. Uh, they're not going to want to be doing a mainstream, the mainstream model of sorts. They've really just stepped into a new zone there. Um, right now, at the crescent phase, we're looking at Taurus energy building upon something and giving form to what's been discovered in that new phase. Um, the soul is going to want to, in some cases, isolate and stabilize. Um, obviously, that's not true for somebody who's famous. <laughs> Probably not going to isolate too much, but it may mean that they're going to uh, need their downtime for sure, uh, their Taurus cave time. But um, you know, in the new phase, you're going a million miles an hour. And in the crescent phase, you come to a halt. And this occurs so you can create specific individual form to what it is that you want to do, whether you're a musician uh, or an actor or whether you're a chef. I love that example, by the way, of a chef. You think of a Taurian, Taurus ruled by Venus, and you think of, of the recipe of something that you want to, to create. Maybe you've explored all these ideas and ways in the world in that, in that new phase, and now you've got this recipe for what it is that you want to create. Maybe you literally want to be a chef, and you have all these different kinds of things that you can pull together from your experience, um, experiences of, of being in that new phase. So definitely a time to uh, bring form, something physical uh, to what you've discovered in that new phase. Now, what else can we say about this crescent phase, Eva? That the crescent phase is also uh, rooting and self-consolidation. Um, as you were saying, that it's taking all those experiences that have been initiated from the new phase or the first house, and it's developing an inner relationship. It's narrowing, narrowing those experiences down relative to what has meaning for the soul. So it can be very much a process of, uh, in a sense, rooting into the ground or consolidating into experiences that feel personally relevant and the narrowing of random action can happen through that. So as you were saying, like uh, bringing in these different ingredients. <laughs> I like that. Yeah, it's true. And, you know, all of this can be done with one's own effort. There's no external help um, in, the, in this context. Um, this is the fine tuning of self-reliance. Um, of course, people in that, you know, are getting help in the world in other ways, but it's very specific to these two aspects and how they feel self-secure. Uh, and this, the soul comes to know who it is by remaining in one place here like the chef in the kitchen, like the musician at the piano, etc. It can play out in that way. Um, there can be cycles of bursts of activity into the world and cycles of almost absolute withdrawal, which is really that Taurian thing. I mean, anybody who knows a Taurus or knows people who have a strong second house or planets in Taurus, you know that there are times when they just need to literally hole up, right? And be alone in order to recover themselves. This would absolutely be true with someone with this particular aspect. Um, and so, you know, thinking about it as you deepen further into the crescent phase, you're, you're reaching into the Gemini. So if you've got a later degree, uh, quintile and beyond, really you're dip in, dipping into that Gemini energy and there's a fear of being limited by anything 
once you reach deeper into that phase. And they definitely um, will not want to be held to do something for like 20 odd years. That would just be torture to the soul. I think that's another reason why I keep bringing up the chef example, because of course, when a chef is doing their work and, and making their creations, they are unlimited with what they can do and use in terms of ingredients. You know, unless you're working for a restaurant that says, this is your menu, this is all you can cook every day. Um, that wouldn't last very long for someone deeper into that phase. You know, they're going to want uh, to have some more options and freedom with, with what they're creating. They need more choices. So anyway, that there's some other thoughts there. Um, obviously, once someone gets to the square, uh, there can be, it can be a two steps forward, one step back, you know, push pull into society. There can be fears around which path do I take? Oh, who hasn't talked to somebody about this or know it for themselves when I'm sure you know this too, uh, Deva, we both have a little bit of Gemini in our chart, but I've heard so many clients say, well, I feel like I'm interested in a lot of things and I just don't know which path to take. You know, there's a fear around um, maybe not taking the right path. And so I want to make one little offering here, and then I'm going to open it up to you for any more thoughts here, Deva. But this is my suggestion to people who have a, a, a deeper Saturn moon crescent phase. I say deeper. I mean, later, I would say from the 60 degree, would it be 60? No, it would be the 75 degree mark to the 90 degree mark in particular, right after that quintile that, you know, Two or three things is, is important to have that kind of variety in your life under the umbrella of what you want to do. Bring some variety, have some options, but when it becomes four and five, then you're really dispersing your efforts too much. Your energy dissipates and you're not going to be as effective and you get really frustrated. So you can definitely hone in on two or three things. I also like to use the example of a braid of hair. If you think about, you know, when, when you're braiding hair, there's three equal pieces of hair or sections of hair that you're giving, uh, that you're allowing uh, to create this braid, which is a beautiful end product, right? It looks best when there's three equal sections. So that means you're giving these, these three equal parts of yourself mm -hmm to some form of creation that you want to say, this is, this is who I am. This is how I want to express myself. So it's bringing a diversity of who you are and creating this braid of energy that says, this is me, not this part is me or that part is me, but this is me. <laughs> so I like the, the image of the braid there. What about you? Any more thoughts on that crescent phase, Deva? Yeah, I really love that analogy of the braid. Uh, from that, it's almost like finding connections or intertwining different pieces that may appear different or being able to extract a root essence or meaning via Taurus from two or three different branches or two or three mm -hmm. different parts of aspects of life and being able to bring them together through that braid in yeah. a way that's very holistic or in a way that's unique and can bring a lot of meaning, uh, can facilitate the uh, self-sufficiency and, and uh, rooting in process. Um, so looking at that uh, Gemini, or looking at that Taurus Gemini, as you were saying, there can be an, a strength in being able to, if you keep it limited to two or three, being able to make connections um, that maybe others weren't able to see. Excellent, yeah. I love that, you know, and I, I feel too with this aspect that as an evolutionary astrology, one of the foundational principles is that when you uh, uncover the root, the branches take care of themselves. So maybe there's a root uh, passion that you have and purpose, like something that you really feel you are known or born to do. And then there's a lot of ways that you want to express that root or that truth. And it's okay if you, if you do something for a while and you've actualized it, maybe it's like one of those branches, Deva, and 
you've actualized it and you're like, you know, it's just not doing it for me anymore. I feel like I rode that wave, but I want a new wave to be born now under the banner of this is my truth. And it, and it is true that we are all in a state of becoming. Not everything is going to do it for us forever in terms of um, keep the candle burning inside of us, that passional, passionate drive and in, that inspirational surge to go out there and spe- express yourself in a certain way. And it's a little bit like I think of musicians that really morph in terms of the nature of of their work. If you look at different albums and what a, what they're going through in their life, they're going to reflect the evolution of that soul. Uh, I just, wow, in this moment, I just thought of um, Jackson Brown when he had that big breakup and he, he wrote that album, I'm Alive, I think it was called. And the picture of him on the front of the album, his head is just barely above water. So it's the all water with his head above it. Like it's, it's literally the heartbreak that almost, you know, that, you know, made him feel like he was barely, barely alive. It was just so for him, like a, it was, there's such grieving, I think, in the lyrics of that, of that album, I'm still alive, I think might even be one of the songs. And so you can see how, you know, for, if you're a musician or if you're uh, an actor, an artist, a chef, or doing any kind of work in the world, a teacher of this work even, uh, you're going to evolve the nature of of the work that you're doing, but the, the root will be the same, hopefully. That's the bottom line, right? We have, all have a responsibility to do what we came here to do. We as souls have a responsibility to God, to ourselves, to the world, to actualize what it is that we came here to do. I mean, no pressure, anybody, but we all have responsibility to ourselves and through extension to God. And that responsibility is seen with Saturn. The connection to the moon would be, okay, how, how do I feel about what I'm doing in the world? How do I feel about who I am in this world? What do I need to do to make that ascent? And um, I wrote these, these planetary phases will really speak to some of the ways, those roads of travel that you can take to get there and to where you, where, to where you can feel you've arrived. All right, let's start and look at some of these charts. As we always say in evolutionary astrology that we have to start with the Pluto paradigm and then weave in the rest. We can't just say, oh, Whitney Houston here, she's got moon sextile Saturn crescent phase, this must mean this, and make a blanket statement about it. Because everybody who has a moon sextile Saturn, even in these signs, didn't end up becoming Whitney Houston and have this incredible voice, a voice (laughs) from God for sure. Um, So we have to look at the whole picture. And, uh, you know, Dave, I'll let you start with this one and I'll support you as we go. Okay. Um, So in Whitney Houston's chart, she has Pluto and Virgo in the seventh house, making a closing or balsamic conjunction to Mercury, also in Virgo in the seventh house. The south node is in Capricorn in the 11th house, ruled by Saturn in Aquarius in the 12th retrograde. Mm -hmm. North node then is uh, Cancer in the fifth house, ruled by the moon in Aries in the second conjunct Jupiter. On Jupiter and the moon are squaring the nodes. So we've got a lot going on here oh, in this chart. <laughs> so much. And gosh, you know, you think about Saturn ruling her south node and the moon ruling her north node. And what, you know, the first thing that comes to me, wow, I just have like, you know, when you're just about to cry because not, I'm, I'm not going to cry, but it's like this realization through these charts and how powerful they are. But it's like that emotion that I'm feeling what this life was about for her. I feel feel her when I look at this chart because this is a soul who obviously we all know didn't go out well, but she came out to um, experience equality in some way and kind of experiencing her worth equal to a man, experiencing her worth as a woman in the world equal to a man. That's why I'm having so much emotion because that, that, that need to know equality for herself. In fact, 
she blew it out of the park in terms of her voice, her music, and far surpassed most men. I don't know the stats, the total stats on all that in terms of what she earned and et cetera, but you know, became a voice that everybody um, knew who she was with their eyes closed. They knew who she was when she opened her mouth and said a few words when she was singing. She was that obviously that well known. Mercury is balsamic to Pluto, which is a theme for lifetimes where you know she's been probably been playing second fiddle to the man. Um, always in a supportive role. You can see that through that packed seventh house. Uh, I'm sure there were many occasions where maybe she wasn't getting paid what she was worth, or maybe, you know, there's plenty of manipulation in the world of music and who knows, probably being robbed blind by some people as well. But she came here to recover her power through her voice, to experience that energy of equality, to uh, let people, let women know that they can have a voice. In her case, with her music, she was uh, on loudspeaker, you know, for the world to hear. And when I think about the word beautiful, or I think about the word harmony, or I think about the word um, something that sounds like it's from another, it's out of this world, so to speak, that is, that is her voice. Uh, very few people can sing her songs because they are that difficult to sing. And you see with all that packed seventh house, which is you know, so much about uh, being in harmony with something, uh, archetype of Libra is very much about the things that we deem as beautiful. Uh, and it's sextiling Venus, the ruler in Leo in the fifth house, which is this energy around uh, being a far reaching energy and being on stage with her music. But we're here to talk about Saturn and the moon, and they're both those rulers of the nodes. Uh, the north node of the moon is in Cancer, which is the sign of the woman or the inner home, how she experiences her inner reality. Of course, it's uh, the moon, the ruler is forming, it's making a skip step to these nodes. And it is balsamic to Jupiter, and that Jupiter rules her 10th house of career. So many things are culminating in this life in ways. Think about that, Jeva and I just did a series on the Jupiter-Mercury phases. And we've got the ruler of her north node balsamic to Jupiter, and we've got Pluto and Mercury, a Mercury balsamic to that Pluto. So this is definitely a, a lot of things that are cu culminating in this lifetime. Um, now, Saturn is in the 12th house in Aquarius retrograde, sextile, moon sextile Saturn uh, to the moon in the second. This talks about her the ability that she had to take care of herself financially, primarily. Um, we spoke about, and just, you know, like I said, hitting it out of the park when we look at 12th house, Neptune, uh, Pisces. This is about an icon, which she surely is, was. Um, Pisces rising. And we can see that Neptune is up there in the eighth in Scorpio. Uh, it's forming a wide trine to her north node, but it's there and it is also forming a sextile to her Mercury. So as we were talking before the show, I think uh, a voice from God. And didn't you say, David, that what was her upbringing again? Yeah, that she started singing um, in gospel church. And Gospel, that was yeah. her root, looking at this Moon-Jupiter conjunction, or at least from, from my perspective, and then seeing Saturn in the 12th house, her voice connected to what you were saying, like a, a voice being given to her from, from God, and mm -hmm. that being a way for her to internally connect to herself, to her inner resources, to uh, finding her freedom. Um, right. from the uh, confinements of the past or from the repression of the past relative to uh, inequality and justice and so on. So connecting that with the South Node in Capricorn in the 11th. Yeah, so not only, you know, Capricorn connects to your skin and Capricorn also connects to uh, black, the black skin in particular. And so the injustice that she experienced through being African American, the injustice she experienced in terms of being and being a woman, and uh, I am sure there is plenty of uh, relationship hardship and 
um, imbalance that she had in this life with partners. Uh, and, you know, that can be seen to, too, this sort of unresolved relationship dynamics that she carried with her uh, into this life. Um, one of the things I wanted to mention here, too, you know, was that her music was all about, they were like love songs, you know, I'm going to run to you. What is it? The greatest love of all, things like that. She had all these songs were, that really when you listen to her music, it brought down the inner walls and it created a greater feeling of connection. It did create an energy of love. She's got this Leo sun, that's balsamic to Venus. Um, just love when she sang was just like pouring out of her from some other portal. And she had that capacity to tap into something universal for everybody. And, you know, she became you know, just her music was just well loved I would universally uh, in, in ways that very few have been able to, to do, women in particular. I mean, I think today I think of people like, of course, Beyonce and Lady Gaga, people that can relate to these really powerful women. But in her time and in her day, um, Whitney Houston was doing the same thing with her music. <clears throat> and so what else can we say here? Um, we've got no doubt she would have had partners that were threatened by her fame or wanted to take her money and do what they wanted to do with it. Um, that moon is opposing Mars. So she's going to, would have attracted people that were uh, intense in nature, right? And um, abusive potentially in nature too with that, with that signature. So a, a lot of, uh, a few retrogrades here in the chart, actually not a lot. I'm just seeing here Saturn and Aquarius retrograde, which again, as you mentioned, David, this unresolved trauma from the past, very much linked with the injustices as a woman, uh, as her, in terms of her race as well. And the other thing I wanted to point out is that anytime a planet is stationary, it's like an exclamation point in the chart. And... <clears throat> And this Jupiter is stationed, it rules her midheaven. It is balsamic to the moon. So, you know, this is something she's been chasing for some time. And this is a time that she was going to, you know, make her mark, literally. Uh, um, unfortunately, the fame got to her. It was, I'm sure, overwhelming as it would be for anybody. And for those people that know her story, she did overdose and she drowned in her bathtub. Uh, and you can see that with the Saturn and Aquarius retrograde. Uh, and it is posing her sun in the sixth house and squaring Neptune in the eighth. Uh, Neptune has to do with drugs and alcohol. It has to do with the water being in the tub there, Saturn in the 12th. Um, um, do you know, I don't remember this in particular. Did she intend to go that way? Was that planned or was that a mistake? I don't know. Uh, from my understanding, it, gosh, I, I don't remember either, but it was due to an overdose. Right. Um, <clears throat> so the thinking is, is that uh, there was an intention uh, for that. Right. Because it was far more than she normally would have taken. Right, that it was, uh, the, the amount that was in her was far above um, what was prescribed. Mm. Um, anything else on that chart? Um, looking at one of the, what I could really see in terms of the Mercury uh, balsamic Pluto and also North Node in Cancer in the fifth. Um, and also uh, Saturn in the 12th uh, retrograde in terms of accessing the emotional body in a safe way through her music. Mm -hmm. She says that one of the most, uh, one of her favorite parts of performing was that it, it, it didn't become, it, it didn't become mental, it became emotional that you feel the audience and the audience feels you. Mm -hmm. um, so I could really see that in terms of uh, also that uh, like breaking down her own personal barriers in order to access uh, the voice that she had been given was through being able to safely open up her emotional channels. 
Um, and that uh, with the mercury being balsamic, it was a way to uh, also balance the mental emotional or to balance the, the part that may have been overly analytical, seeing that it's this Virgo energy. Um, so seeing how a part of that performance too was a way to uh, help her break through her own uh, perhaps uh, inner walls, seeing the south node being in Capricorn, mm -hmm. um, also in the 11th. Um, so uh, seeing how it was naturally and seeing that moon's in the second, also with Jupiter squaring the nodes, it could become its own form of self-therapy. Um, right. Second house being able to, to ground in and obviously becoming not just a resource for her to sustain herself, but gosh, she did. She was just blew him out of the water. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she, she's definitely had some early exits in other lives. You can see that with the moon square the nodes, right? And the ruler of her north node in Cancer when she was younger. You can see that. Um, going back to what we were talking about her drowning, um, it, I read here that she had used cocaine pr just probably immediately prior to drowning and her condition indicated an acute use of the substance. There are also traces of marijuana, oh. the muscle relaxant flexural, an allergy medication, Benadryl and Xanax. So um, honestly, you know, they're, they think it was accidental, um, but what happens when you start, you know, with drug interactions like that, um, especially Benadryl, wow, mixed with other things can really do weird things to the nervous system. But um, it was just, she was just not many, I don't know, six or nine months just out of treatment. So she'd been wrestling with it in the past and it's pretty hard to break that addiction once you're on that train. So anyway, that's uh, Whitney Houston, a beautiful, beautiful woman, a, a beautiful musician, and uh, she definitely left too soon. So all right. Thank you for that, Diva. On to the next. Edgar Casey. I'll let you take this or start it. Okay. Um, in his natal chart, he has Pluto and Taurus in the 10th house. He has South Node in Virgo in the 1st house, ruled by Mercury and Pisces in the 7th, conjunct the North Node in the same house and sign. And the North Node then is ruled by Neptune and Neptune is in Taurus in the ninth. In this case, his Saturn moon, um, his moon is also in Taurus in the ninth, and his Saturn is in Pisces in the seventh, conjunct Mercury, conjunct the North Node. Um, so from what I understand of his life, that he uh, was very, he felt very connected to traditional uh, cr Christianity growing up. <laughs> Um, he w read the Bible often, and um, it gave him a, a source of uh, emotional security to, to link with that structure. But when he started having these visions, or when he started having these random channelings, so to speak, that came in and of their own volition, mainly when he was asleep, <laughs> uh, seeing the Pisces energy, um, it started to... Uh, tune him into or it started to uh, break him in into understandings that were uh, more transcendent, much more universal than just uh, uh, Christianity and it helped him uh, expand uh, beyond that particular belief system. Um, he was able to ground more into uh, esoteric knowledge, uh, seeing this moon in Taurus in the, in the ninth house. Uh, also Saturn being in Pisces in the seventh, that there would be a, an underlying need for a, a connection to something higher or a, a, a deeper calling, so to speak. Um, perhaps emotionally at first feeling secure with a specific religion, seeing Pluto in the 10th, uh, seeing Moon in the ninth, uh, but how he was brought out or how his inner, his inner world was being brought out was through these spontaneous channelings that were uh, also medical in nature. Um, how to diagnose things, um, uh, tuning into uh, the Akashic records, I believe they call it, um, being, uh, but literally the egocentric structure 
um, melt, I mean, in, in conjunction with Saturn, almost dissolving relative to receiving information that was beyond what he was secure with, <laughs> um, which uh, helped him stabilize progressively into more of a, a universal uh, and also uh, esoteric knowledge of um, uh, what are words for that? Uh, uh, more of how, uh, more of a complete picture, more of a, a universal picture of things. He was um, uh, tuned into reincarnation through these channelings, which uh, also upset his uh, traditional learning. Um, but it was like emotionally he was integrating these larger truths where he was progressively bringing his inner world out uh, through uh, imparting uh, what was coming through these channelings, uh, these readings that were tuned into the Akashic records. Um, and uh, he was known for seeing the South Node in Virgo. Uh, he was known for his accuracy and his precision that um, the diagnoses, even though they were medical and he'd had no specific medical training, um, these were the things that ultimately helped. And so then uh, became that for him, um, became that dilemma of how to keep doing these readings. <laughs> right. um, because, <laughs> uh, um, and that uh, he kept receiving guidance to, to continue on, um, but of course, you know, with a, a disclaimer, uh, so to speak. Um, but in terms of uh, what he, uh, the knowledge he was then able to impart is that essentially what I like most about him is that these channelings were mainly about centering and imparting this knowledge to others, seeing that it's uh, um, uh, the seventh house Mercury or seventh house Saturn, north node in the seventh, uh, also conjunct Mercury in the seventh. From my understanding, he really did impart that we all have access to these things. Uh, especially because of his own personal experience. This wasn't something that he sought after. It wasn't a focus. It just spontaneously started happening. Um, so it gave him, from an egocentric point of view, that real inner orientation of just being the receiver, uh, looking mm -hmm. at that seventh house, ninth house, not being somebody who fell prey to egocentric delusions of grandeur relative to channeling, which could essentially most times be in the unconscious. Mm -hmm. um, but his orientation to it was literally just being the receiver. And when you are able to make yourself just the receiver and nothing else, sometimes you receive things that are challenging even to yourself. <clears throat> Absolutely. I think of like a satellite signal, right? Like Uranus. Yeah. As a satellite signal and it's sitting there in the 12th house retrograde, which means that guy is just like plugged in astrally, like nobody's business. So, you know, if we think about Whitney, we think of her Saturn in the 12th and Aquarius retrograde sex to tell the moon, which would be, I feel too much. And his would be, I see too much, <laughs> you know, right? <laughs> I, I view too much. I see too much. I know too much. Uh, there's, it's not linked with it being crescent, it's just linked in these cases with this Pisces Aquarius combination, right? It leads to, uh, in, in, in Whitney's case, just it's like putting in uh, it's too much electricity in a light socket. Like when you go to Europe and you bring a hairdryer from the US and try and plug it in, it's just gonna blow a fuse. So that's what, in both of these cases, I would say, Whitney being, I feel too much, the high, heightened sensitivity with the Saturn in the 12th sec, in Aquarius retrograde um, sextile to the moon can be, you know, there's an ease of integration of whatever's going on in the world or even in Edgar's case, his inner world. And so it becomes it's just this natural flow of energy. Uh, and so it's, it's, I know that he, your dad used to say that I wish I could turn it off, turn it all off, which were, all the things that he used to see, you know, the, or the things that he would say he would see just this, the movies of everything going on in the world. Edgar Casey's got a, you know, a consciousness that's similar in terms of seeing things that he can't turn off. They're just like movies, right? Ongoing over and over and over. So 
that's what happens when you put Uranus um, in a position like this too, on top of that Saturn moon sextile. It keeps, keeps the door open all the time. So, all right. Uh, what, what stage of evolution would you call him, Deva? Oh, um, I, I mean, uh, um, I would say third stage individuated at least, transitioning mm -hmm. into the first stage spiritual. Yeah, um, there's a real beautiful quote that to me kind of encapsulates his, his spirit or uh, what was coming through his work. He says, you reach heaven uh, on the arms of those that you have helped. Oh, gosh, that is so beautiful. I have not <laughs> heard that. Of, well, and that it definitely, just, yeah, just okay. met it. <laughs> um, so uh, looking at yeah, it really inspired me. <laughs> Oh, wow. I mean, think about that Saturn in Pisces in the seventh sextile, that moon in Taurus in the ninth. You've reached heaven on the arms of those you have helped. Amazing. Uh, for him, the receiving comes from the giving. Mm -hmm. Right? So, wonderful uh, interpretation. Thank you. All right, let's move to the next chart. Paul McCartney. Okay, go ahead and start this, Deva. He has uh, Pluto in Leo in the 11th house, conjunct Mars, balsamic phase uh, in a closing phase, and south node in Pisces in the 6th house, north node then being uh, in Virgo uh, in the 12th house, and Saturn moon. He has moon uh, in Leo in the 11th house, and Saturn in Gemini in the ninth. Um, so looking at this chart, uh, what's, what's, uh, strikes out or what sticks out is that he was ultimately bringing his inner world to the outside, or he was ultimately, uh, structuring his inner world, uh, externally through his art, through his artistic expressions that were very much different or very much unique from uh, conventional or from uh, common wisdom, uh, religion, art, uh, all of these kind of dynamics. It's like this 11th house moon, uh, his way of bringing himself out uh, was through expressing in his own unique way uh, spirituality, art, these many different forms of creativity. And that that ultimately became a way for him to uh, express his own inner orientation um, to uh, to the larger whole or, or to these types of uh, religious or uh, spiritual things uh, or matters. One of his quotes, he says, I'm not religious, but I consider myself to be uh, spiritually interested or to be spiritually oriented. Um, mm -hmm. Looking at that north node being in the 12th house, south node in the 6th. Um, so it was very much, uh, he was also, he was given his own gallery uh, for, for his paintings, for his art. Um, that that was a, a facet that he had independent from music uh, for him to bring uh, his inner um, uh, his inner knowings or seeing the 12th house, seeing the way that he was tuned in, uh, that was his way of being able to express or to actualize that, uh, in a way that gave his, his view or that in a way that also expressed, uh, with the Gemini energy, diversity, unity and diversity. Um, uh, so looking at, uh, uh at this NATO signature, um, uh, from my understanding, also seeing how uh, this Mars is balsamic Pluto in the 11th, it's culminating a whole cycle of desires and how, how those were acted upon. Um, so uh, I, I believe that from what I was reading that uh, it was one of those situations to where um, uh, uh, his orientation to fame um, is fleeting, it comes and it goes. Um, it wasn't really what his creative uh, abilities were ultimately linked to. So 
uh, being in this incredibly beyond famous band had its own effect of culminating desires of the past for recognition, to be known, and so on. And it became more of an outlet to express these things that were individual to himself. Uh, <clears throat> absolutely. And of course, you've got that Saturn and Gemini with Uranus and Gemini as just in terms of him being a writer, a very clever writer mm -hmm. that reaches cross country lines, right? <laughs> Ninth house and its sextiles is Mars and his Pluto. Um, so much of his own past being worked out through his writing. I love some of my, he's got all the great ones like, Hey Jude, here comes the sun. Um, what is it? Yellow submarine come together. Gosh, those are oldies. Those were back in the sixties, but he's just um, really, had a way with words <laughs> and a way to reach the, the heart with his music very directly. Of course, all that Leo energy in the 11th house. Again, one of these singers that you know right away, as soon as you hear his voice, easy to know, you know what I mean? That kind of recognizable sound. Um, what stage of evolution would you put him? I would put him perhaps, um, at least in the individuated, maybe third stage, um, based, on, right. based on his ability to uh, integrate into society with uncommon knowledge, or from my point of view, relative to what you were sharing, his ability to express or his ability to, uh, to open up emotional realms through words. Um, that can be a, a, an intention of the third stage individuated is to, to uh, bring an alternative knowledge within the mainstream. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, there's a, a number one hit that he also wrote called um, World Without Love. I can't remember how it goes right now, but I look at that 11th house, the Pluto Mars balsamic and the moon there um, squaring Venus in uh, Taurus in the eighth and that looks really reflective of that of that hit what would a world be like without love or what happens when you lose love just that that knowing of that that experience of that broken heart and writing from that place so he definitely to me that too this is such a, a chart of someone who's you know always wants to be part of that tribe and of course the Beatles were like a tribe for a while um, like brothers like tribe mates, you know, you can see the signatures in the 11th house, how important it is to come together and not just the little tribe that they are, but bringing the tribe of the world together, right? To unite people through the music. And the Beatles had a way of doing that, just helping the sun come out and every soul that listened to their, and his music in particular, I would say. Here comes the sun, one of my favorites. All right, so a lot of Leo energy we're seeing here. Next, do you wanna just do a brief one on her? Okay. Um, in her natal chart, she has a Barbara Streisand. She has Pluto and Leo in the fourth house, a South node in Pisces in the 12th house, North node in Virgo in the sixth, um, North node ruled by Neptune, in the sixth and, or sorry, south node ruled by Neptune uh, in the sixth house. North node then ruled by Mercury in Taurus in the second, uh, conjunct the sun in Taurus in the first. Um, and in her case, she has Saturn in Taurus in the second, and she has the moon uh, in Leo uh, in the fifth house. Um, so we're looking at a, a moon quintile, a moon quintile Saturn. Uh, because of the degree, 28 Taurus, uh, and the moon is at 10, uh, 10 degree Leo in the fifth. Um, so from my understanding, um, looking at how her inner world is being brought out, um, she, grew, uh, she grew up in situations of poverty um, to where she had to take care of herself a lot. Um, you can see that with Saturn being in the second house. And to me, this is growing up for her emotional imprint. She says, I remember all I ever wanted when I was little was love. And my mom always gave me food. 
<laughs> oh, oh my gosh, that is so funny. <laughs> Oh, that, that is really funny. So she, so from very early on, she was thinking, you know, how can I get myself out of these situations of poverty? What resources do I have? What creativity do I have? But it all, from my understanding, being based on that, that underlying emotional imprint of when she was younger of, you know, <laughs> hey, <laughs> Mm -hmm. I'm being I'm being provided for in these very basic ways, but I do want love. <laughs> I exactly. Do. And that doesn't cost a penny. That does not cost a penny. You know, the other really big thing that she is known for, apart from her her music, her wonderful music, is uh, uh, her stage fright. And you can see that, too, with her south node in Pisces, with Venus and Pisces there, and Ceres. Uh, the, just this high degree of sensitivity to all those eyes on her. Mars, uh, so really Jupiter more so, squaring that Venus and Pisces in the 12th. Uh, and of course, fourth house Pluto's souls can be, can be highly sensitive, that cancer energy. But that Pluto is squaring her sun and say, it is a last quarter square. Oh, no, it's not. It's sorry. We make the sun station in evolutionary astrology because it's the center of the universe. <laughs> so it would be considered a first quarter square. But anyway, there's uh, just an insecurity that she had and um, pretty hard on herself, very s judgmental. And also just probably like most people, a fear of being judged or um, just a fear of not doing well up there. Um, her Neptune is in Virgo and it's retrograde in the sixth, squaring her Mars. Like, am I going to forget my words? It's a common one. <laughs> I used to remember feeling that way. Um, and so I say that because whenever I had to get in, up in front of people and there's a lot of things that I wanted to say, um, you know, it, it, it's, a, it's a second fear not the number one fear. I think the number one fear is the fear of death. And the second fear of all people is the fear of um, being on stage or is that how you say it? Um, stage fright. Yeah, that kind of fear of, and it really is linked with being judged or ultimately persecuted in some way. But yeah, stage fright is, is the second fear. So you can see that again, and, and some people are, are more sensitive to their environment than others, right? Some people can literally feel what people are feeling and, or, you know, look at their face and, and know what they're thinking. And she's got that, so much of that Pisces sensitivity in her chart. Uh, and that Neptune, by the way, in Virgo in the sixth is trining her Saturn, is trining her, her Uranus. So 27 years she went 27 years without performing. Wow. Yeah. Almost a full Saturn cycle without performing. So you think about her inner relationship to herself. And yeah, you said it. Like so much of this life for her is about uh, learning how to feel secure on her own uh, without any kind of need for external feedback and that comes from a, a mother where she wanted love not more food right <laughs> um, yes. and she got plenty of, uh, of love from the world with her music but um, I think there was a fear of, of it all going wrong or making a fool of herself which of course never happened but it was the fear that she had of that happening that created this paralysis in her and that would be the Neptune and Virgo retrograde squaring her Mars in the third. You, this has to come from somewhere. So of course, I'm sure in a past life that any number of things uh, along these lines could have led to this, um, mm -hmm. this feeling, the, the emotional reality within her of not being enough mm -hmm. or not being perfect. Not being perfect would be would be really think about it this the ruling planet of the south node past in pisces is neptune and virgo retrograde in the sixth not perfect enough it could have um that was squaring mars because of what she said or didn't say or mm -hmm. saying <laughs> whatever it might have been so the fear of those consequences where that would lead 
was what kept her off the stage. And she did come back on for a bit. I know she's been interviewed in the last few years and I'm sure in her soul, she felt like I gotta get back on this horse knowing that we need to resolve and evolve, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> resolve to evolve, right. re-enter the fracture. In order to heal it, we need to do these things. So um, yes, she's got to become her number one. That is the Saturn moon sextile here knowing she's enough, that she's whole into herself and know how to provide in that way for herself in every way. So as she definitely broke the pattern of poverty, I would say. Yeah, it kind of story. makes me also think of that role she played in the Prince of Tides, um, where she was, a, she was a, a, a counselor to... Uh, a man who experienced a lot of trauma and persecution and essentially wanted to hide and didn't think that he would be able to carry on any sort of relationship or any, especially any kind of romantic partnership. And uh, she, it was, she was facilitating or she was uh, kind of lis listening to that. And uh, amazing how you can, she, in that movie, she was a therapist, but you can see that dynamic of um, fear of failure, of not being enough, um, mm -hmm. not being worthy enough in the type of roles that she played in the hiding or uh, not, not, not taking center stage, so to speak. Yeah. But it's interesting that she was a therapist for somebody who was experiencing those emotions. Yeah. And so it allowed her to step outside of herself, kind of watch herself through the eyes and the soul of that character. Right. To work on her own, on her own feelings of that lack of self-worth. Uh-huh. Yeah. All right. Great. Well, let's move to the next one. All right, and I think this is our last example, but we wanted to throw in a square here for you guys. Um, before we go here, what do you think, uh, what would you say about uh, Barbara Streisand's stage of evolution? Oh, uh, my estimations, I would say f first stage individuated, yeah. just that's breaking out. Thinking. Yeah, that's what it feels like to me too. Okay, we've got Marilyn Monroe here. We've got a moon square Saturn. You can see the Saturn there in the fourth house, retrograde in Scorpio, squaring that moon in Aquarius in the seventh house. I mean, this is also a soul that, but even with all the attention, massive fame, of course, with that 12th house Pluto on the north node, trining her Mars, trining her Saturn, just like a, a sex idol of sorts. Did I say that right? Anyway, um, you know, men just falling all over themselves, um, you know, <laughs> over her. And um, of course, she's a beautiful, beautiful woman. But the inner world that she experienced, you know, um, you can tell that with Saturn and Scorpio retrograde, squaring Neptune on one side and the moon on the other, that inwardly she felt very alone. Um, I don't know much about her early childhood. I don't know if you knew any of that, Deva. But again, the south node in Capricorn with the ruler Saturn in grade kind of reminds me of a mommy dearest signature where she also didn't ever feel like she was enough, perhaps by the mother. But um, yeah, she spent a majority of her uh, childhood in either uh, foster care um, oh, because go. her natal mom was not able to provide for her in the ways that she needed mm -hmm. um, until she was at least older. And even then, <clears throat> it never felt right. So, um, yeah, you see that Saturn squaring the Neptune and Leo. It's like the disappearing, <laughs> the mother that's not there, right? The invisible mm -hmm. mother. And then when we, when we think about adoption or we think about foster care or we think about uh, kind of like a mother once removed, maybe an extended family taking care of a child. We, we will see the archetype of Aquarius present somewhere. Uh, and the moon in Aquarius here is squaring that Saturn. So every child, we all have the same need 
um, to know where we came from. Every soul wants to know where it came from and every soul wants to be loved and nurtured in the way that a mother, a natural mother would do. And so when that doesn't happen, and any time we have a strong fourth house, especially putting Saturn here squaring the moon, you know that she was going to have to figure out a way to take care of herself emotionally. And what ended up happening is she was, you know, getting so much attention from the world, in particular the opposite sex, I would say, you know, it was feeding something in her, a feeling in her that she wasn't getting otherwise. And that's where you can see this grand trine between Saturn, Mars, and Pluto. Um, ultimately, it was just a, a, a Libran thing where that moon sits, meaning based on appearances, right? It's just how she appeared on the outside that people were fawning all over. And so that led to its own kind of pain. Uh, what else do you know about her? Uh, that when she was younger, she was discovered while she was working in a, a factory. Um, was it during World War uh, World War Two? Mm -hmm. um, and that uh, from there, um, she was offered a, a modeling uh, contract. And that uh, as she progressed within her career, uh, she ended up uh divorcing because her husband was not in support of her having her own independent career um so she made steps through that seeing this uh moon in aquarius i would also say south node in capricorn in the six um <clears throat> and uh seeing her own efforts to uh, individuate herself uh, also saturn being in the fourth house retrograde in scorpio uh, making that square she in her own way, that was perhaps her own way of trying to rebel or trying to liberate herself from being associated with these types of relationships, even though she was playing it out through pictures and so on. Um, uh, she was also resistant towards uh, being controlled. Mm -hmm. um, and the yeah. rebellion against uh, arbitrary uh, authority, uh, she wanted her own career. Um, she wanted to be able to make those uh, decisions uh, without uh, the support or, co or consent of another. Um, and looking at this too, that she that was her own way of uh, perhaps bringing to closure or also culminating the emotional dynamics that that you were speaking of of uh, um, uh, wanting to also be. Uh, accepted or loved or nurtured for what she was on the inside, seeing that mm -hmm. Pluto North Node conjunction in Cancer in the 12th. Um, and so relative to the Saturn square, it's like a, a rebellion. Um, oh, definitely, yeah. And uh, a liberation from these types of, uh, it's like a, tra because Pluto's on the North Node, everything's being funneled in this direction. And the ruler of that is the moon in Aquarius. Mm -hmm. um, so it's like a way of her uh, distancing, uh, liberating um, uh, in her own way. It's like recreating in order to rebel, <laughs> um, yeah. in order to bring to closure so that she could ultimately, uh, from my understanding, um, she could become uh, self-secure, um, seeing that North Node being in Cancer conjunct Pluto on the 12th, that's a... Uh, to me, that, that symbol within itself indicates uh, um, becoming secure um, uh, f from one's own means or uh, internal security coming from uh, a connection to what brings her a, a sense of, of ultimate meaning or uh, being connected to something higher. Um, and that being a way to heal self-image or that being a way to heal emotional dynamics of the past. So it's like the rebellion perhaps was a way of her saying to herself, I'm more than that. I'm mm -hmm. more than this. Um, so it's, uh, uh, it may have been like that square recreating situations of abandonment, betrayal, mm -hmm. um, throwing her back on herself. So as you were saying, she could learn to support herself. Mm -hmm. yeah, she, I mean, she absolutely is um, you know, this is definitely a chart of a woman who has come into this life to try and make it on her own, 
yeah of course that energy of rebellion she did think of herself as being very too shy and insecure to have a future in acting that was her beauty that <laughs> kind of got her in the door mm-hmm. um that shy quality quality and insecurities that cancer Virgo combo uh with the saturn in the fourth and scorpio squaring that moon that would be the uh, the shyness the insecurity of course the south node in the sixth contributes to that as well also she did die of a barbiturate at overdose and again we're seeing strong pisces influence here with the pluto on the north node in the 12th um and uh and let's see, Neptune squaring that Saturn in the fourth. Uh, she was actually found naked on her bed, face down. <laughs> and which to me is just like the symbol for, because she was a sex symbol. That was the word I was thinking of. Oh. Um, you know, a sex symbol. And she's, you know, face down, which is kind of like, I surrender, I'm done. Um, so yeah, too young to die. Again, this too young to go, like a Whitney Houston, uh, and Marilyn Monroe, you're, you're going to see some stress to the moon, to the nodes, some, something linked with time. Uh, and you can see that here with the Saturn square moon in Aquarius. Now, not everybody with the signatures necessarily going to go young, um, but usually when people go prematurely, you're going to see something like that occurring in the chart. So uh, it's funny because she was actually famous for playing comedic roles like the blonde bombshell and such. Um, and I was looking around trying to see that in her chart. Of course, she does have Venus in the ninth house and it's trining her Neptune uh, in the first house, but that's what she wanted to play. And I, I would say, I'm sure it was the comedy of life, Jupiter in Aquarius and then seventh sextile Venus in the ninth um, that kept her going as long as it did, You know, just learning to laugh at things when life became too serious, because I think life was very serious and hard and empty very early on for her without a mother around, you know, and and what have you. So anyway, this is an example of a square. I mean, all the charts that we talked about today, even though there's sextiles involved, it doesn't mean their life was easy. (laughs) Um, It might mean that they had a a greater ease of integration of certain things. Uh, in terms of their career for Marilyn Monroe, that, that Jupiter, excuse me, the Saturn moon square uh, was indicative of her not wanting to be controlled, of wanting to do things her way and bless her heart. I love that um, as a woman in the world and this, this need for equality as well, which was, would have been very difficult in the times that she was um, growing up in and uh, being in the world in that way. So All right, I think that's it for today. Thank you, Deva, for joining me in discussing Saturn moon crescent phase. We'll be back in about a month to discuss Saturn moon first quarter phase. And for any of you who uh, would like to join uh, this upcoming thread I talked about earlier, are you spearheading or to check out any other posts or ask questions on the message board, please go ahead and um, access it through the School of Evolutionary Astrology, and uh, we'll look forward to joining you again next time. Until then, namaste.